um, welcome to my video on uh, cross-section of the small intestine. You can find the drawing to accompany this, or at least the black and white part of it, on my Google Plus page in um, a little booklet called Blood and Guts, Mastery of Biology 242. Um, and this video itself is found in the Biology 242 lecture playlist. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a cross-section of the small intestine. It's just kind of a cartoon way of helping you understand the different layers of any uh, tube of small intestine. Uh, this part right here shows where it's attached to um, the mesenteries, um, which are connective tissues that kind of hold all of the coils of the intestines in place. This area in here is where the foodstuffs are actually passing through. And so out here would be what we call the peritoneum. And if you've ever heard of someone get peritonitis, it means that bacteria that normally are in here were able to get all the way out here. Okay, so enough talk without coloring. Let's get coloring. I'm going to um, start with yellow and uh, fill in this little area right here. And this is the mucosa. So we'll use a black pen to label the mucosa. This is the innermost layer of the small intestine. That name mucosa helps you understand that it certainly is a mucous membrane. The GI tract is lined with a mucous membrane. The cells that are found here are called simple columnar epithelial cells. So it means they're epithelial cells for sure. And they are just in one layer, that's the simple, and they are in column shapes. So in Biology 241, you learned about simple columnar epithelial cells. And really, the most famous place you're going to find them in the body is lining your GI tract. In some places, anyway. Definitely this area. Okay, so notice that it is wrinkly. It has big wrinkles called pleca, and then little wrinkles called villi, and then little wrinkles on little wrinkles that are called microvilli. But they all serve basically the same purpose. Pleca, villi, and microvilli are basically wrinkles in the mucosal lining. And their purpose is to increase the surface area. If there is more um, wall to touch, <coughs> excuse me, if there is more wall to touch, then there's more opportunity for nutrients to bump into part of that wall and to either be bound and absorbed or broken down by enzymes. So we say that it maximizes efficient digestion and absorption. There are some cells along this lining right here that are called uh, brush, or that contain brush border enzymes, excuse me. And it's called the brush border because it's so wrinkly, with all those microvilli, that it actually looks like the bristles on a brush. But they're called brush border enzymes. And so there are some important enzymes for chemical digestion that are actually attached to these cells. And these aid in the work of, um, I'll put aid the pancreatic enzymes. because. I like to talk about the pancreas as being the major place where the enzymes of chemical digestion come from, but these brush border enzymes help out with that. 
Okay, so now let's move on to the submucosa. And we will put the submucosa in purple, but there's some other fun things I want to put in there too. It's all of this area right here, and it contains, um, actually, let's use green. One of my favorite things about the submucosa is that it contains a lot of very active white blood cells that defend our body. You can find a lot of a particular kind of white blood cell called mast cells in this area. They are a lot like basophils, but they're in the tissues and they release histamine. You'll also find, I think I'll use um, red, if you have a red or a pink pen for this part, uh, capillaries, because this is where the nutrients are absorbed into the blood. So the foodstuffs come through the lumen, and then the nutrients pass through the mucosa, and then they're absorbed into capillaries in the submucosa. This is good if we're talking about nutrients. It's bad if, for example, bacteria or toxins from a bacteria can get through the mucosa and into the blood. That's what can happen with foodborne illness. So um, let's highlight the white blood cells with green. So these white blood cells are on guard against anything foreign entering the capillaries. Then let's use a blue pen to show some specialized mucus glands that um, originate out here in the submucosa, but they squirt their mucus into the lumen to reduce friction as the foodstuffs pass through. Got all kinds of good stuff on here. Then let's go ahead and color, color the capillaries with a pink highlighter if you have one of those. And remember I said we'll make, in general, the submucosa purple. So just take your purple highlighter and kind of scratch up the rest of this. Okay, so then use your purple pen to label the submucosa. Let's go ahead and label it um, right up here at the top, kind of at the top of our picture like this. So this is the submucosa. And it contains all these different things that we put on there. You can use blue for the mucus glands. And it contains capillaries to absorb nutrients. If you've ever heard of like E. coli O157H7 and how it can cause um, septicemia or septic shock if it gets in the blood, this is how it gets to the blood. If it damages the mucosal lining enough, then the bacteria or toxins from the bacteria can get into uh, the bloodstream. Okay, so I put capillaries to absorb nutrients, but in disease states, bad things like bacteria can get in there. Okay, and then in green, we have the white blood cells that are patrolling. And remember I said especially mast cells. And they fight pathogens. But in the case of mast cells, when they're irritated, they or stimulated, they release histamine. And that can cause diarrhea. So if someone has a food intolerance or a food allergy, it could be, or it is, associated with um, these white blood cells not working right, responding when they shouldn't. And I might also make a point that infants have a, what we call a leaky gut or a leaky uh, mucosa. 
So foreign proteins are more likely to cause white blood cell response because they can get through the simple mucosa, the simple columnar cells, and irritate the white blood cells there. So that's one of the reasons why you have to be careful how quickly you introduce particular kinds of solid foods to babies. Okay, so now let's look at the, did I get everything in there? I did capillaries, white blood cells, and the mucus cells. Okay, good. Or yeah, mu mucus glands, excuse me. Now let's do the muscle. So we'll use our pink highlighter. And there are um, different kinds of muscles in, oops, why did that get blurry on me all of a sudden? There we go, sorry about that. I don't know how long it was blurry. Got a couple layers of muscle in the small intestine. These ones that we're drawing around here are uh, longitudinal. They're sort of coming toward us. Or actually, those were the circular ones, excuse me, and then longitudinal. So we have these different layers going in the opposite directions. So when one of them squeezes, it can make the size of the lumen get bigger or smaller and move the foodstuffs along. And then the other one is going to affect how lengthened or shortened the small intestine is. And so the smooth muscle is responsible for both segmentation and peristalsis. So we'll go like this for our smooth muscle layers. And that's the third layer. And the stomach, although that's not what we're focusing on this drawing, the stomach actually has a third layer that goes angular, and so we call it an oblique. And that, of course, helps the stomach to mix the food really well. So these smooth muscles are responsible for peristalsis, that's moving the foodstuffs along, and also segmentation. And that's more of a mechanical back and forth movement that helps to make sure that all of the food touches the walls and the nutrients are digested and then absorbed. Um, if I want to take you back a little bit to Biology 241 when we talked a ton about the nervous system. And you'll remember, I hope, with <laughs> jog the memory a little bit, that this is smooth muscle, right? So therefore, it is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And furthermore, if we want to stimulate peristalsis and segmentation, then we would want to stimulate parasympathetic nerves. So parasympathetic nerves release. Do you remember which um, neurotransmitter it's going to be? Hopefully you do remember it is acetylcholine onto, do you remember what kind of receptors receive acetylcholine? It's cholinergic. Muscarinic, actually, muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And that is going to increase um, the activity of these muscles. Okay. Now, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the outer layer, and that is the peritoneum. I'm going to make a um, little bit of a gap, though. When, watch how with my orange highlighter, I go kind of around the outside like this. Oops, sorry. Boom. Okay? And um, let's call that this fourth layer. The peritoneum will label it up here. Peritoneum literally means around the intestine. Means around the intestine. And it has two layers to it. It has a visceral layer and 
a parietal layer and actually so now take your orange pen and try to go right on the black line all the way around and you'll have successfully drawn both the parietal and the visceral layers. So each coil of your intestine has a layer of connective tissue on it and that is called the visceral layer. So let's see, we've got the visceral layer, right? This visceral means like on the innermost part basically. And then you've got the parietal layer. Hang with me here. This is kind of interesting if you can get this picture in your mind. That's the parietal layer. The whole thing is the peritoneum. Sorry, my arrow should really be more like that. So this whole thing. And notice the little space in between. Well, actually, there's a little bit of slippery fluid in there. We can put this on here like with a yellow highlighter. And we call this serous fluid. You might remember this also from Biology 241 when we talked about membranes. This is an example of a serous membrane. And that fluid in the middle, middle is um, serous fluid. Uh-oh, this pen's not working. Serous. And the purpose of the serous fluid is to reduce the friction when this coil of intestine is rubbing up against all the other coils of intestine. And if it didn't have this slippery fluid, then the different coils can stick together. And that is actually one of the symptoms um, of peritonitis. Okay, so let's see what else. So the serous fluid, the purpose is a slippery to reduce friction. The nice thing about this is that we get lots of S words here. So we have a serous fluid, it's a serous membrane too is another name for this, and it is slippery, and the other S is that it's got to be sterile. This area should not have bacteria on it, whereas the mucosa is covered with normal flora. That's actually right, we forgot to write that down here, or I did filled with normal flora. And in fact, healthy people have a great diversity of bacteria here. There's some um, new research in this area is really um, exciting for I would say the next 10 or 20 years or who knows how long, that people that are healthiest actually have the greatest diversity of bacteria in their mu uh, the, mu the mucus layer or in their lumen, whereas and that is as opposed to the peritoneum, which should be sterile. And peritonitis is inflammation of this area. So whenever you see itis, it always means inflammation of something. So inflammation of the peritoneum. Okay, and then the last thing I want to do 